gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to take a few moments to thank you for being the God of grace that you are, that for blessing us so richly and so abundantly, for asking so little of us compared to what you've done for us. I ask your blessings on continued blessings on this ministry and the lives of, of those of your people who watch it and listen to it. I ask that you would filter out any foolishness but seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We've been studying together in the epistle to Titus, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were somewhere uh, around the area of verse 8 or 9. I'd like to do a little bit of review. I want you to take note once again of just how that all through this epistle we've seen doctrine that's always preceded instruction. In fact, uh, at the beginning of this epistle, we see that we are God's elect, that it is according to the truth that godliness surfaces in our lives that we have a guaranteed expectation or confidence of eternal life, which God cannot lie, promised before the world began, which in, in this case uh, uh, was quite some time ago. Now, this has always been the case, and the reason for this is because just open-ended instructions given to us apart from the revelation of what God has done for us in Christ would be nothing more than just law. But we are not under law, but we're under grace. Now, there's something that I, I want you to really consider heavily I've been doing this with you for quite some time and I want you to understand something that is it's probably one of the most important things that you could grasp at, as a Christian in your walk and in your relationship with Christ. There is a, a huge gulf, a grand difference between those who do something for God based on the idea that if they do this, they will achieve some sort of standing or position before God. That they're not, they're, they're sort of, think of it sort of like at the begin, they're at the beginning of a race. And uh, the gun sounds and they start, they start running. And if they do everything right, if they run around the track just right, and if they stay in their lane, and uh, you know, even if, if there's hurdles involved, if, if they make the, the, the right number of hurdles and they don't knock any down and, you know, if they get to the finish line and they've, they've done uh, a good job of, of racing, then they'll be rewarded. And that's kind of the mentality of most of Christians today, not just today, but it has been for a long, long time. In fact, our enemy, Satan introduced that whole idea of, of a merit-based religious system long before we ever arrived on the scene. There's a huge difference in that in beginning at the finish line. And I know that that, that tends to go against sound human logic or, or sound human reasoning. But we, if, if you understand that we begin on the basis of the fact that we are already victorious, that we've already achieved a certain uh, standard, uh, a, a position before God, that's not based upon our own performance, but on what Christ did, that He's placed us in a position to where that we are righteous, fully righteous, that we're, we stand before Him spotless, without blame, that we are indeed holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. 
then all of a sudden our walk, our run, our race, if, if that's what you want to call it, becomes something entirely different. At least in the, fr from the mental aspect of, of how the, the believer views his relationship and his walk with, with Jesus Christ. I've, I've tried to avoid ever getting really personal in these videos. Uh, I can tell you that at, I've never been under law. I was always, uh, I always saw myself under, under grace. I knew right from the very beginning when I came to know Christ. And uh, that's not Him coming to know me, but me coming to know Him. And, and me coming to know that I was His child, that He had died in my place that uh, he had set me apart from my mother's womb. Uh, just like Paul was the Apostle Paul, the, the author, the human author of this epistle, was always Christ. He, he always belonged to God long before he ever even realized that, that there would be a, a conversion uh, on the road to Damascus, his Damascus road conversion. And when we consider the life that Paul was, the activities that Paul was involved in prior to that, it's, it makes all the sense in the world that, that it was just as our text is, is telling us here, that for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, but after the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit which He shed on us abundantly, through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope or the confidence, the, the, the guaranteed expectation of eternal life. And folks, this is what we're, we're looking at here in the text. This is sound, healthy teaching. This is sound biblical doctrine. Just as the emphasis was set before us at the beginning of this study and everything rests upon it. The, the sound doctrine is the foundation of everything that in our lives that springs forth from it and it does have to do with motive. It makes an enormous difference if, if, I'm, if I've set about to, to try to live as who God says I am as opposed to trying to to achieve some state or some position in which I somehow in my mind, my unenlightened mind, believe that I'm not. I'm trying to attain to a certain status. I'm trying to gain merit before God. And folks, most Christians, I think, would, would almost have to agree that, that that is true. They know that we're not saved by works for the most part. Yet in their lives and in their conduct, in their behavior, in their speech, they tend to contradict that fact. Now our present text is basically, if, if you could allow me to paraphrase from the original Greek text, it says that, that, that you were not delivered from your former way of life by anything that you did, no, not by any works that you did. I remember many, many years ago, it's, it's been over 30, 30 years ago, that the person who led me to the Lord, God rest his soul, he's, he's gone on to, to rest, to, to sleep in Christ. He taught me one of the most foundational, fundamental truths that, that a believer could ever know. That would, that would ground me in the faith and make a difference in how I lived my life from that day forward. And that was that I was God's child. 
that there wasn't it wasn't by anything that I did that I didn't become a child of God by anything that I did. What I did was what it, what appeared to me to and, and even to others on the surface as being something that I did to become a child of God was a little more really more accurately put what it was was it was the normal response of any one of God's children who come to realize that they are God's child. It wasn't that I did something to become God's child. Everything that followed was a confirmation of the fact that Christ had died in my place, that I was always His child. It wasn't because of anything that I did that I became born again, born from above. We know John 1.13 says that we were not born again by the will of the, of the flesh, by the will of man, but of God. Our text, present text says, but by mercy shown us, by His dying in our place. We've seen this in the, in the present text. His death was effectual. His death was not provisional. His death was not conditional on our acceptance. The fact that He died in our stead, in our place, which guarantees that we will never die. Washing. We were washed. I was washed. I was washed from my sins. Not just the sins that I had done in the past, but the sins past, present, and future. The sin issue was settled forever between me and God. I no longer had to ever, and I'm, I mean ever, become downtrodden, become defeated in my mind because of my old sinful nature, which was crucified with Christ. Whether I, I now stood before God spotless, blameless, wherein the Holy Spirit caused a change in my mind and my heart, that is what our text is is saying, which He poured out on me abundantly, richly, says the authorized version, abundantly through Christ. How many Christians have you met lately that are just so excited they're, they're beside themselves over the fact that, that God has poured out on them the mercies, the, the grace of, of Christ so richly and so abundantly. And the, to me, I read that, folks, and, there, and it, if, it, if it says anything, what it is saying is that I, I'm like coming behind in, in no gift, no spiritual grace, no spiritual uh, gift. There's nothing lacking. To be blessed so greatly, poured out so abundantly. I mean, what more could any Christian want or expect? And there was a reason for this, and this is why we have the Hena Clause there in the original text. In order that, those three, those, those three simple words, in order that, carry so much weight. In order that, having been made righteous having been made even the english folks is telling you that you're not made righteous by what you do having been made righteous by that grace that unmerited favor you as his son and the reason i say son is because sons are those son a son is one who receives an inheritance from his father you as his son would have confidence, confidence, absolute confidence in eternal life. And I don't know how many believers that I've met who don't have that. And why don't they have that? When, when the, our text is so clear, some of you who come here to, look, to listen to me, you read along with me in the text and and you wonder the same thing. You ask the, yourself the same question. How can others be so blind 
to what the text is so simply saying. Well, I, I think there's a number of reasons for that. The, the, the most, the primary reason being that it, it, if that isn't proof that God the Holy Spirit is involved, directly involved in the, the illumining, the enlightening of a person to the truth of His Word, then I don't know what is. We live in a time in which Christianity, so-called, for the most part, has departed from the faith once delivered unto the saints. Oh, but Steve, how can you say that? How can you say that Christianity, for the most part, I mean, it, it's so active, it's so involved, it's laboring so heavily, heavily for the Lord. It's it's sending its people out into the mission field, and it's and it's gathering together, uh, meeting uh, Sunday after Sunday, and even even in during the week, in the middle of the week. And these people, they love the Lord. And I've seen the tears flow down from their face. And they pass around the offering plate and they give. They invite one another to their homes. They would do anything. They'd give you the shirt off their back. Well, folks, I don't want your shirt off your back. If you think that by giving me that shirt, that you're earning favor and merit before God. Now, I'm, I'm more than willing to accept that shirt if you're giving that shirt to me because you know that God has blessed you so greatly and so abundantly and so richly that you can't do anything else. And that the motivation of your heart is one in which you're giving all the glory and all the honor and all the praise to God because of the, not because of any works that you've done, but because of the mercy shown you by Christ dying in your place, washing away your sins, where you stand before Him spotless, blameless, without fault, where that the Holy Spirit Himself has caused such a change in your mind and your heart, having poured out richly through Christ all of these blessings, so that you, knowing that you have been made righteous by that unmerited favor, you as His Son would have confidence in eternal life. Folks, if you can't look at Titus 3.5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, According to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. That is, that is the regeneration's washing, as I pointed out in my past video. It's the Holy Spirit's renewing, which He shed on us. And that word shed is the same word used for Christ having shed His blood. He shed on us abundantly, richly, through Jesus Christ our Savior, our Deliverer, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. If you can't see, folks, that there is no synergism in verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, then you are doing nothing but ignoring the text, the plain, clear words of the text. Not by works of righteousness which we have done but according to his mercy when we come down to titus uh, 3 8 chapter 3 verse 8 the first thing we see is is trustworthy is the same now i'm going to be reading from the the original text here and the words may seem a little out of place in comparison to the authorized version but in the greek many of you greek students you you've come to understand that when you when you read through the greek you'll see the placement of the words were placed there for emphasis trustworthy is and that's in parentheses the word is is really not there trustworthy the saying it's articulated the logos saying the word 
What, the, what that is, is telling you plainly, folks, is the word, that is God's word, can be trusted. God cannot lie. Trustworthy is the same. And cons concerning, the word concerning there is, is peri in the Greek. It's, it means full consideration where all the bases are covered. You've covered all the bases. These things. What are these things? The sound doctrine that we've been looking at. I want you to affirm strongly. The word affirm strongly is a word that, that it, it means emphatically confirm with confidence. You, you are being commanded to em, emphatically confirm with confidence what things? Sound doctrine. And then we have a hint of clause. So that. So that. And then here's where the words are, seem a little jumbled because they're, they're put in a certain order may take care the word the word may take care is give heed take thought good works and there's our our two words our, our familiar phrase good works works resulting from sound doctrine folks this is not your works it is not your works oh i know it appears to look that way on the surface but but all of those Christians who, any, any Christian who, who looks at these good works as his good works has not, has ignored the surrounding words in the text. The word uh, to be devoted to, that's to lead by example. And I want you to take note, it's, it's those believing God. So literally what the, what the original text is saying is that to affirm strongly so that those believing God may take care, or that is give heed, take thought, lead by example, to be devoted to good works, that is works resulting from sound doctrine. It's putting the cart before the horse. It's that, those works that stem forth from, that flow. Out, it's a natural outflow of works that are related to that, that inner, the, the, the new man, the, new, the sinless new man. It has nothing to do with law, nothing to do with flesh, nothing to do with confidence in self, nothing to do with, with trying to earn or gain merit or favor before God. So that those believing will. Notice it's those believing will. And notice that it's, and I couldn't help but notice, it doesn't say so that those who don't believe will. Big difference. So that those believing will lead by example, giving heed, taking thought to works resulting from sound doctrine. And then we see the word, the phrase, these things again, these things, that is sound doctrine, are, the word are is estin in the Greek, it expresses being, that is to be, it exists. And how does, how does sound doctrine exist? How does, what is sound doctrine? How does it stand alone in and of itself? Well, it is excellent. It is excellent. The word excellent means beautiful. The word kala, it's even the sound of the word is beautiful. Kala, that which inspires, motivates others to embrace what is lovely and praiseworthy. That's what the word excellent means. And profitable. That is useful. Profitable. Well, no wonder. No wonder it's profitable. Because at the judgment seat of Christ, we will see our works judged or that the hay, wood, and stubble will be separated from the gold, silver, and precious stone. Profitable, useful to the men. That's, it's literally to the men, plural. And uh, I, when I read this, I couldn't help but think of 2 Thessalonians 2.10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, 
because they received not the love of the truth that they might be what? Redeemed? No. Saved. Delivered. We know from Romans 5, 9, much more than being now justified by His blood. That's how we were justified. The word justified, folks, was made, is, is, is made righteous. We were made righteous by what? Something that we did? No. I mentioned Paul earlier on, on his... On, his, on the road to Damascus, Paul had been justified, made righteous by what? His acceptance of, of, of Christ on the road to Damascus. Somehow he sought out Jesus Christ and, and by some miracle Jesus Christ appeared. No, no. Paul was justified, made righteous by his blood. Oh, but Steve, I understand all that about the blood and all that, but but it's, it's that Jesus Christ, God applies the blood when we, to our lives when we accept Jesus Christ. Well, where did you come up with that idea? You'll, you don't, there is not a single verse in all the Word of God, in the whole entire New Testament, Old or New Testament, which would substantiate the idea that God somehow, His death for you was, was conditional or provisionary in which you were held the ultimate final trump card. You were, you were the deciding factor. It's not really true that God chose you. He didn't choose you before the foundation of the world. He didn't set you apart from, from when you were inside your mother's womb. That Paul really wasn't, didn't belong to God until he made some decision on the road to Damascus. That is not what sound, healthy doctrine teaches. What it teaches us, folks, is that we were made righteous by His blood. That His death for us was absolutely certain. I'm convinced that when He hung there on that cross and He died and his, He gave His life for us, that He knew us by name, that He died in our place, not so that through some natural means or effort on our own part or some, some particular mind, mindset that we would be somehow, hopefully, prayerfully, we would be somehow swayed to believe that that death that He died for us would become effectual. But that as our kinsman Redeemer, He died in our place and, then, and we can have confidence, absolute confidence in eternal life because we know that Him having died in our place, we cannot die. If we go on and we look at, at Titus 3.9, it makes all the sense in the world. The original text, I'm reading from it, foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law. The word there is foolish, it's moros, it's, it's really the word where we get the word moron. It literally means moron, is what the word means. Uh, if you look at the original Strong's Greek number 3474, it's, uh, it's from the base of mysterion. It means dull or stupid, that is, is uh, heedless. Uh, it even says blockhead, I thought that was kind of funny, uh, absurd. Foolish, moronic. That's what these arguments and quarrels about the law are. And it's no surprising that the Holy Spirit, not, not Paul, that the Holy Spirit in authoring this epistle would be bold enough to contrast sound doctrine with such foolish quarrels about the law. Folks, I want you to think about this. If the good works of verse 8 was a result of law. If we were under law as a rule of life, if the good works of verse 8 was a result of law, why would verse 9 admonish us to avoid it? That's what, that's what I want you to take note of.
if we go ahead and read through verse 9 and into 10, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. You know, you, you know, in thinking about that verse, you know, if I'm going to be honest with the text, I at least, at the very least, I have to stop and I have to ask myself, why would it be unprofitable and vain? You know, isn't this what we want? Isn't this what we want is to, is to get people who, uh, who profess to know Christ to be under grace, not law? And we're told the text is clear. It says, but avoid foolish questions. Oh, but I've got a friend that's living under law and he's, he's asking me these questions and, and perhaps he really wants to understand the truth. And yet my text is saying, for they are unprofitable and vain. I think the, the emphasis there in the text is on the word strivings. Strivings about the law. It's to avoid the foolish questions. If, if they are in, in fact unprofitable and vain, and if in fact, and I believe it is true, God cannot lie, that a man that is a, a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Well, that's, that seems awful uh, blunt. Uh, I've even had some Christians tell me that that, that, just, that just seems awful cold-hearted. After a first and second admonition, reject. You know, and as I wrangle over that verse, there's only one conclusion that comes to my mind, and that is, is it's not that we don't have a heart for an, an individual that's, that's, that's truly uh, seeking uh, to, to un, un, uncover answers, you know, from the text. That they don't have a sincere heart there and in, 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 in yearning. I mean, after all, doesn't, doesn't Scripture say that, that seek ye first the kingdom of God and, and His righteousness and then all these things will be added unto you? You know, after a first and second warning, I'm to reject this individual. I think the only conclusion that we can draw from this is, is that if if our persuading them, uh, or if, if the, to, to say it more correctly, if the Holy Spirit can't persuade them, then we certainly can't. You know, I think we step outside the realm, outside the circle, outside the sphere of that which is praiseworthy, that which is lovely, that which is, has to do with sound doctrine, our life, our message, our ministry is Jesus Christ. Everything that's in us should just should scream out the loveliness of Christ and what He's done for us. To be involved in, in any activity that's outside that sphere, outside that realm, outside that activity, to quarrel about, you know, have to, you know, quarrel over subjects that have to do with, yeah, but Steve, you know, I, I know we're under grace, but, you know, uh, we still got to keep the law. I think that there's a certain answer. That that we should we should we should give to a, to a question like that. It is it is certainly not. I and I've never found it to be in my life. I've never found it to be very profitable to try to put others under grace. Try to get to, or to put them under law to get them under grace. And that's exactly what I'm doing. If I'm striving and I'm arguing, you know, and there's contention and. You know, in trying to answer these foolish questions, if, if I'm trying just for the sake of winning an argument, then basically that's what I'm doing. That's what I've, I, have, I have stooped down to that level 
and I'm doing the exact same thing that they're doing. I'm just simply, quite simply, putting them under law to try to get them under grace. Folks, we know from Scripture that His sheep, they hear His voice. It's the only reason why that you're, you're who you are in Christ is because you heard His voice. And that was, that had such, there's such a personal, intimate, there's such a tender degree of intimacy that's involved in Him knowing us the way that He does. We weren't some object lost subject or object that, that He didn't know at all, that He only came to know because of something that we did. And if that's how you view Christianity, then you really haven't studied this book very much. Look, I'm out of time. We're almost at the end of Titus chapter 3. We'll conclude our study in Titus. I have no idea where the ministry will go on from here. I know that 2021 is rapidly approaching. It's looming larger and larger as we look out over the prophetic horizon. I just ask for your continued prayers for this, for this ministry, uh, for our relationships with one another, for these turbulent times that we're going through. I hope that all of you are safe out there. I hope that you will, God will continue to bless you and keep you safe. I love you all, I truly do. I want to thank you for all of your messages, your kind messages of encouragement and support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.